to the organizers of this conference, uh, thanking them for the opportunity uh, to be able to discuss, which most of you will find to be an arcane uh, topic. But nonetheless, in the theme of future uh, technology, uh, I, I think it's, under, uh, it's, it's uh, really focused on, on the key. Um, I uh, appreciated the last talk. Of course, there are lots of interest in machine learning. Um, I'm, I find it as, as not a contributor directly in that field, uh, the focus on um, supervised machine learning, when in fact real science is done with unsupervised machine learning, where in fact we're accumulating data, but we don't understand the true dimensionality. We don't understand the clustering of, uh, of that data. So I expect that as time progresses and we master the techniques of taking advantage of this data, this enormous data-driven form, that there'll be a continued uh, drift, not just to deep learning, but to um, uh, unsupervised learning. That's where we'll do the real learning. All right, so, um, ah, okay, I have a screen here. <sighs> One takeaway from the last presentation that directly contributes to uh, the story I'm about to tell you, and that is that the focus is data-oriented and data-driven. During uh, the one um, uh, lifetime of the field of computing, and frankly, that's about equivalent to my lifetime, please don't ask, uh, but uh, in a single, a single time, uh, we have, and this is an understatement, we have exceeded a factor of 10 trillion, 10 trillion in the performance that has been delivered uh, across the last six or seven decades. Uh, that's an extraordinary number. There is no human technology. There is no parameter set or dimension in which you can come anywhere near, even logarithmically, can come anywhere near numbers like that. And yet we are at a pivotal moment when in fact uh, that very rapid exponential growth, without exaggeration, uh, may be coming to an end. Uh, I'm here to tell you that, uh, well, probably exponential growth per se may be coming to an end, but increased growth by orders of magnitude are still in front of us if we're prepared to relinquish our unquestioned assumptions about how we're building computing systems. And, um, well, let me push the button. So I, I tried very hard to understand this vast array over, again, the last seven or eight decades uh, of, of computing. And I, I think I've caught this fairly well. Unfortunately, I've used an ambiguous image in the uh, lower left. Um, uh, if any of you are paying attention to the news, the science news at least, over the last few days, you will have seen an announcement uh, by Google that they believe, or they would like to assert, that they have achieved this special, this special moment, this special break point of um, quantum supremacy. Now, there's another term for that, and I've lost it, uh, frankly. Um, uh, and that may actually be a, a fundamental exaggeration. Also, uh, one has to recognize that quantum computing, per se, in terms of the delivery of extraordinary performance improvement on some problems does not deliver that same performance gain on other problems. So to some degree, quantum computing is a special purpose uh, technology, or at least a domain-specific technology. But I use it as an example for, for something that is just over the horizon. Uh, we're we're uh, uh, confident uh, in the underlying theory and physics. Uh, we're hopeful in the engineering, and we're mystified by the possible applications. That's in the uh, lower right-hand corner. In the upper left-hand corner, in the 1930s, so now we're talking about, a, about 100 years before quantum computing becomes truly um, uh, conventional, uh, is uh, another paradigm of computing that we refer to as analog computing today. And the original technology in which this was used, and what is it for? It, to put it simply, well, to put it simply, uh, you're solving a large set of first order differential equations. And anything that can be modeled that way, and believe me, that goes from any of the mechanics or the plasma physics of the universe um, or, or uh, any of the uh, uh, other forms of dynamical systems, 
Uh, this is a very powerful representation technique. And Vannevar Bush, who um, uh, is, is well known, among other things, he was a president of MIT. He is the inventor of the analog computer, which had several generations of technology applied to it. And he was the president's science advisor um, uh, during uh, some very important critical. We would probably be spending even more time on analog computers, except uh, about 15 years later was the breakthrough paradigm shift that was mentioned, and that is the von Neumann computer architecture, first inspired by the uh, vacuum tube technology and some other uh, latent technology. This is the upper right-hand corner, and, and if you know, someone's going to yell out, no, that's not a von Neumann machine. Yes, that's correct. Uh, this is ENIAC, and this was developing the technologies, but it was still a calculator. It didn't have the principal properties of von Neumann, but von Neumann did help with its design and building. And then the, the lower left hand, you'd think, oh, I'm talking about clouds. I'm not talking about clouds. I needed something that was a giant uh, 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 unformed um, uh, area that has yet to be described. Sorry about the ambiguity, but uh, here, there is a space. We don't know what goes into that image, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Because today, the von Neumann architecture as the underlying paradigm for uh, producing computing is dead. Uh, most often classified as the end of Moore's law, Gordon Moore in the late 1960s making an observation about the exponential growth of transistor densities using semiconductor technologies, and uh, we've been riding that ever since. And where are we today? Well, we're at the extraordinary performance peak of about 200 petaflops. And that's with uh, the machine uh, at Oak Ridge National, Lab at, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, the machine called uh, Summit. Uh, this replaced a recent machine, and I'm not going to get it right, Tianha. I don't think that's the right machine. Uh, but uh, ch ch Chinese machines, they've done remarkably well producing a, a string of machines that have been number one. Uh, the actual benchmark number that's used, the benchmark being LINPAC, or, or more precisely, the high uh, performance uh, LINPAC benchmark, HPL, uh, uh, the original number came out at just over 122 petaflops. Should have changed that number. The, mo uh, the most recent release last June in not Heidelberg, not Hamburg, Frankfurt. Um, uh, they've all, the meetings have been held in all those uh, towns, cities. Um, uh, th that um, uh, they gave a number somewhere in the 140s and it will continue to rise uh, slowly. This is the classic almost platform, uh, that is to say uh, plateau, I beg your pardon, plateau of platforms where a combination of uh, multi-processor, uh, multi-core chips combined with uh, accelerators, GPUs, but of different forms, have been put together in, frankly, a very difficult medium of, of programming and application, but nonetheless producing uh, uh, some remarkable results with enough effort uh, put together and is being used for, as we uh, learned um, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, machine learning. I might also mention that they managed to bring the uh, power advantage uh, to in a much better state. 15 megawatts is actually low. Um, now, over the history of computing, and, and, and this is not because I dwell with history, I've lived through most of it, but it is that throughout the history, computing has changed uh, paradigms or architecture models as the technologies, the enabling technologies uh, were driving these changes both to uh, permit the explo uh, exploitation of, of uh, new um, opportunities but also to uh, address the challenges that came with those technologies. And while I will not go through this series, uh, you, you will probably note uh, several of them. And no, I didn't use Univac 1, but um, I did use the Craze, and I did use the deck machines, and I stole some ports, uh, parts from an old IBM 7090. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and so on. And yes, uh, if you had looked at the photograph on the first, uh, the first slide, I'm standing in front of a Cray uh, machine that uh, uh, has all of these kinds of components 
as well. But we have been in incrementalism for literally decades where the changes are changes to past products, improving those products, and making adjustments as the parts are integrated. And this has been very powerful. Uh, this is this is allowed business and uh, the vendors on the one hand and the application and library writers on the other to build on uh, their past successes. And this is usually captured. This is an iconic diagram. Uh, a credit to Eric Strohmeyer of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. Uh, this has been uh, represents 25 years sample points every half year. And the middle line. Uh, the red line is um, the number one machine measured by the LINPAC benchmark. Now, to, to first examination, this seems to be, roughly speaking, a, 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 a straight line, albeit with a little bit of uh, uh, modification up and down. Uh, uh, but if you look more closely, you see that the slope is rolling off. And this is, uh, there are a number of complex factors involved in this, but basically this reflects the end of Moore's Law. And so what is going to come after this? What is the next paradigm of computing? What is the next way that we're going to exploit computing at much better cost, much lower power, and much higher performance and lower size? And so that's what I'm, whoops, there, that's what I'm telling you. Now, one slide of pedagogy. Um, one of the things that all of those computers and computer classes and paradigms had in common is the same fundamental parameters that they either intentionally and directly addressed or unintentionally uh, at least had an approach to it, but, but they, they didn't manage it very well. And, and, and I, I call this uh, uh, in the acronym SLOWER. It stands for starvation, amount of parallelism available, amount of work. Latency, that's the distance, usually measured in cycles of information moving across the system. Overhead, this is the additional work that you don't really want to do, you wouldn't do if it were a sequential program, but that you had to do to manage the resources and schedule the tasks. Um, and uh, uh, waiting, that's waiting for the availability of resources, either physical or logical, uh, sometimes referred to as contention. And then there's the issues of energy and reliability. I'm not going to read this slide to you, but in every one of those machines over the last 70 years, you can explicitly define the strategy, the approach that's embedded in the concepts and implemented in the actual technologies to mean this. And this will be true in future computing as well. Now, as we are approaching uh, Moore's Law, and if there's any doubt about this, the fact is that we are now, uh, uh, the vendors are now producing nanoscale technology. And by nanoscale, I'm referring to a single digit uh, nanometer feature sizes. Uh, that are going on. And uh, uh, in the labs, it's you know, down below five, uh, seven nanometers, 10 nanometers. There, uh, we're, we're beginning to develop uh, lines of products uh, being produced there. We have reached the end of the exponential growth. We have more power consumption than we can possibly uh, deal with. And because of that, our clock rates have flatlined. Um, they vary a little bit, but they're somewhere in the low order of gigahertz, anywhere from about 0.5 gigahertz up to, oh, 4 gigahertz if you're really pushing it. Uh, the von Neumann bottleneck, that, that's actually a term, the von Neumann bottleneck, which is the uh, separation of processing to um, memory. Uh, has been retained throughout the history of computing. We'll come back to that, but that is a key problem. There's the issue of how to actually exploit uh, parallelism, come back to them there as well, and you can read the rest of the, of the items. These are the challenges facing uh, computing. An additional one is asynchrony. Uh, asynchrony really didn't become an issue in early computers or even mainstream uh, computing at the beginning of the LSI and VLSI period. Asynchrony is that uncertainty of the time it takes to, to perform an action. And this can be due to a, a number of reasons, not the least of which is the ever-increasing memory hierarchy of conventional uh, machines. And so at this point, right now, 
Uh, we are at the tail end of uh, the last 70 years of using the von Neumann model, which is a sequential model of uh, computing, uh, and we've gone through f at least five generations of technology to do that, and we can't go much forward from here. Yes, we'll get to exaflops a factor of five or 10, but we'll pay for the cost there. And by the way, if you actually look at the numbers, you find that almost all the computers measured on that 500 list is somewhere about a factor of 100 lower. So about 95% of all the machines, the 500 machines, are somewhere in the one percentile range of this. So while we talk about supercomputing, we're really talking about the racehorses or, I don't know, some car I'm supposed to uh, talk about pretty, you know, over a million dollars for a car. I have a Tesla. Even e Elon Musk wasn't able to charge me a million dollars. So he tried. Um, the uh, uh, pivot point now is, and I call it the neo-digital age because we're moving ahead. Okay, this slide and the next slide are the take-home slides. Then they can pull me off of this stage. Here's, here's the magic. We've been making a mistake for so long that we're not even aware of it. And that is that all of the assumptions that are built in to the very successful von Neumann model and the computer architectures based around that, you'll say, well, what about the vector machines? What about the SIMD machines, et cetera? Yeah, but those are really derivatives. Yes, they're working on larger objects than a uh, single scalar, uh, but uh, they are still basically controlled by sequential, sequential execution, then finding different ways to use finer grain, uh, finer grain parallelism when it's available. The biggest mistake, and I'd ask you to read the whole slide because I can't read it all to you, but the biggest mistake is that an optimization that, have been, that, that was originally made, which was to keep the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, or the floating point unit, as busy as possible. That's the criterion by which all of the architectures are designed. That was a great idea in the first 25, 30 years of computing, because floating point was the most expensive thing. But it's not anymore. Go look at a photograph of a die, Google it, and you will find that a about 5 to 7% of the die area is the actual ALU. The rest of the architecture, including the memory hierarchy and all the speculative execution, and I could go on and on, the register sets, all of that is there for no other purpose than keeping that 5 to 7% busy. That's stupid. In particular, it's stupid because we're not even caring about the floating point when we talk about machine learning. We're talking about data movement, data-driven requirements, the data structure, the metadata evolution. Other things like the fact that uh, the von Neumann machine continues to separate the memory from the uh, processor is ludicrous because when originally we did that, it was because one was in vacuum tubes and the other was in magnetic cores. And I remember magnetic cores. They're now the same thing. They're now semiconductors, slightly different processes, but we can put the logic and the memory on the same chip. And in fact, we're already doing it, right? That's what caches, uh, SRAM caches are. And then, of course, the von Neumann architecture is inherently sequential, meaning anytime you want to exploit the parallelism, or almost any time, to be explicit, you, you, end up, um, you end up having to do that in software rather than the hardware, say MPI or OpenMP or OpenACC or CUDA, and, uh, and certainly Python. I think Python was mentioned. All right, this is the second slide. This is an alternative. Now, it's hard to convey what we're trying to do, but what we want to do is change the emphasis from an ALU-oriented and optimized architecture class to a data bandwidth and data latency class. This is not a new idea. In fact, it's remarkable how many instances of research one can find all the way back to the 70s uh, on this. And in fact, one of the great ironies is in 1950, maybe it was 1949, von Neumann developed 
a non von Neumann class of architecture called cellular automata. Any good computer science major at least has, has learned about this specific thing. And some of those ideas, which uh, only once in a great while became very interesting, is in fact the opportunity where locality and low overhead uh, and localized uh, memory is exploited, but it had to be taken further. And so we call this class of architecture, or really it's you know, higher than that, a family of architecture, this continuum computer architecture. Like most of our business, that phrase is also being used for a completely different thing, and I'm sorry. Uh, and here, what we find is that we can put a different kind of physical object on a chip, smaller than a processor core, and completely part of a global namespace and a global parallel control set, all done with an architecture that supports single or almost single cycle execution. We could have already done this. And we can do it because, you know, it's one of those rare instances when your design is not driven by complexity. In fact, it's just the opposite. You know, your body has trillions of cells in it. Your brain has somewhere around 89 billion uh, neuron cells. I don't know how many of them are working for each of you. But, but the, see, the, your, your thought process is an emergent behavior from very simple operations uh, to the magnificent thing uh, that at least we think is happening. Even vision is an emergent property. Uh, you're not seeing this image. You're, you're, you're immediately seeing lots of different pieces of, of the image and gives you the sense of what you're seeing, which is me. Um, uh, so very simple, simple design, about uh, 100 to 200 uh, K thousand transistors per unit. Uh, we call these compute cells, not very imaginatively. And thousands of those on a moderate size cell um, uh, can be put together on a single socket, sockets with some stacked dies, small numbers. Those put together, and you can imagine the hierarchy. This is not new. Uh, this certainly went back to the days of um, uh, uh, the uh, IBM great Blue Jean series, Alan Gara. Uh, and those guys uh, did. And when you, when you get that far, and we've done the deep analysis, indeed, right down to the design analysis, uh, we find that uh, in a relatively small number of uh, modules, uh, well, here it's 1,000 modules, but I'll show you a picture. It's a surprisingly small amount of, of space. Uh, we can hit about an exaflops performance which is what people are racing to do right now internationally. And when we study the power for this, quite amazingly, the power is just over one watt per chip. In fact, that's one watt per socket, which includes some DRAM built on top of it. Not that that adds a lot. Very low power. Why? Because when it's not running in a cycle, it's not burning. Here's a picture of uh, a, a, a thought experiment, a Gedanken experiment, to uh, uh, use Einstein's term. Here we have uh, one X of flops, and that is flops, not ops, machine in less than 400 square feet. Now, the machine I showed you, the Summit, uh, I know those guys, uh, Buddy Bland runs that machine. And I asked Buddy, uh, you know, so <laughs> how much floor space does it take up? And he said, well, I don't know. Um, I figured he would know this machine is somewhere on the order of uh, uh, you know, more than $100 million. I thought he might like to know. He said, it's somewhere between 8,000 and 10,000 square feet. So that's a factor of 5 to 10, smaller than an exaflops machine, and yet a factor of uh, 20 to 30 larger in, in floor space taking up. Now, uh, someone might ask the question, well, how do you program the thing? In fact, it's a deeper question. How truly do you control the thing? And we've developed over a number of years, although we were doing it for a slightly different purpose, uh, something called the parallax execution model. Each of the machines I showed you had their own execution models. Cray worked on vectors. Then uh, Ken Batcher and other worked on SIMD, single instruction stream, multiple data stream. We reached the point where uh, uh, we used... Um, 
uh, MPPs, multi parallel, um, multiple processor parallelism, there we go, uh, uh, with method, me the message passing, or more formally, the communicating sequential processes model, Tony Hoare, back in the late 1970s. Uh, and now we're at a point where we can't continue to drag those forward. We need yet a new execution model. And we need them to have several properties, not the least of which is that they actually exploit runtime information. Because the complexity of the problems, when we've already talked about them over the last two days, those complexity, the data structures are changing. They're irregular. They have lots of metadata. And the resources are valuable, partly because of power considerations. And so uh, you really want the machine to understand what's going on and to make decisions on a continuing basis to get not optimal because uh, mathematically that's not possible. Optimality requires non-causality, but within the constraints of causality, uh, we want to do this. And we can do this by building runtime systems. And so I, I, you know, I, I, needless to say, I give entire talks on this one and supporting slides. But this can provide the programming model, and it provides uh, the uh, model for runtime systems and the requirements for architecture control. Now, we did, we've done a lot of analysis, as you can imagine. And uh, one of those is the Graph 500 benchmark. Uh, it's a breadth first search algorithm. And the fastest machine is not the Summit machine on this. It's actually a Japanese machine, uh, the K machine. No, that's not a serial. Uh, and uh, it runs, it, it's, a, it, it's an elegant, it's a beautiful architecture. It's extremely well balanced. Unfortunately, it's a little bit too expensive and it's not the fastest machine on, on Linpack. But the K computer uh, has the, uh, has the uh, uh, record on term, in terms of doing the uh, breadth first search graph application. Now, this is a static graph, not a dynamic graph. We did the analysis. Now, there are certain rules with benchmarking that you can fudge with, you can play with, and use it to your benefit. That's not exactly cheating. There are moments when what I'm about to say is nonetheless disingenuous. All right. Uh, that machine is, and did I put this down here? Uh, uh, over 5,000 square feet. I've been there. Oh, that's me standing in front of it. Um, good, not the same tie. Uh, and uh, how much would we need for a continuum computer architecture to beat this with the rules of the benchmark? Not 5,500 square feet. It's 12 square feet. Okay. And if I'm off by a factor of four in terms of number of nodes, it's still 12 square feet and probably a little bit more in addition. So if we have a machine that addresses starvation, latency, overhead, waiting for contention, not to mention the energy and reliability issues, which I don't have time to discuss, you can just blow away, admittedly cheating, not cheating, twisting, in the age of Trump, uh, you can blow away uh, uh, conventional processing. And I'm at my last slide because this is future technology. It's ironic to me how much of the future technology has a presence in the past. And so the only assumption that I kept that we've been using for the last seven decades is that at least in the last three to four decades, it's super, I'm sorry. Bear with me. It's uh, uh, silicon-based uh, technologies. And as I said, the uh, clock rates reach for maybe 7 gigahertz on a, on a liquid cool good day, right? 7 gigahertz. Back in the 1950s, a British scientist uh, invented a superconducting switch. Um, uh, a great accomplishment. He wasn't very modest. He named it after himself, uh, the Josephson Junction. No, his name wasn't Junction. Uh, 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 Josephson Junction uh, was connected by others to make highly sensitive, exploiting quantum effects, but not the way quantum computing does, uh, uh, to make ridiculously sensitive sensors 
that have been used to measure the tiniest changes, uh, among other things, in uh, uh, thermo, thermo ionic uh, uh, various uh, physical systems. A colleague of mine, now retired on Silver, a Silver, then of TRW, realized that this discrete behavior that uh, these uh, little loops, two JJs and a, an inductor made called squids, the discrete behavior could also be used for logic. And so he developed something called uh, single flux quantum gates that was expanded by people at Moscow State University and invested in uh, uh, to uh, RSFQ. In 1997, I think it was in San Jose, I may be wrong, uh, I had, I personally, see I'm talking about myself for the first time, I had on the floor of the supercomputing conference the fastest logic that had ever been at any supercomputing conference. And if that's not significant enough, that was the fastest logic that has ever been since 1997, another 20 plus years. Why? Well, I had a, a big doer of liquid helium. I got in trouble with the fire department over that, but it's another story. The record, the record for the clock rate of SFQ technology has been for over a decade, over 700 gigahertz. And what's truly extraordinary about it is that the power, because it's superconducting, is almost down to nothing. So it's a double whammy. So if you drop the technology assumption that I've used through the rest of my slides, and you talk about building a cryogenic environments for, let's say, something like niobium oxide, bring it down below four kelvins, uh, which compared to what you people with quantum computing are doing, somewhere around 20 millikelvins, it's, you know, frankly, a day on the beach, right? It's balmy. Um, uh, we can talk about building uh, a new class of machines. And when you do that, and we've done the analysis, when you do that, you get within a factor of two to yada flops. Now, I bet this is the first time the word yada flops was used in this conference. Yeah, OK, I got it confirmed. And uh, this means that we're looking in front of us in the future technologies potential. If we relax, if we get rid of our underlying and unquestioned assumptions, we're looking at another factor of million in front of us. So the end of Moore's law is not the end of computing and its performance growth. It is, in fact, a new opportunity that frees us from our unquestioned assumptions of the last many decades. Thank you all very much.